Thank you for listening to the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast, available on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, and Stitcher. Also, please follow Matt's Movie Reviews on Facebook, YouTube, Parlor, and Instagram. And of course, be sure to visit www.mattsmoviereviews.net for the latest reviews, top 10 lists, and more. Now, on to the show. I'm Carla. Hi, my name is Mary. Hi, uh, I'm Susan. Hi, I'm David. I'm 40 years young, <laughs> and um, I live with my mother. It's okay. Can I, Mom? I'm looking for a deep connection, someone I can give myself to completely. Hi, I'm Andy. Thanks for being here today. I've been waiting for this moment for what feels like forever. Two friendship. We're going to get to know each other. Friendship. Talk about whatever you want. But more than anything, we're going to have some fun. Too bad. And hopefully, yeah. it's the start of a beautiful relationship. Hello and welcome to the Matt's Movie Reviews Podcast. I am your host, Matthew Perkovich, and this is episode number 289. Releasing September 11 in select theaters, digital and video on demand is rent a Power, a character-driven thriller that stars Brian Landers Falcons as David, a lonely bachelor who finds a mysterious VHS tape called rent a Power, hosted by the charismatic Andy, played by Will Wheaton, driven by character rather than caricature, and featuring terrific performances, rent power takes on heavy themes with humanity, and is sure to leave souls stirred and minds abuzz at its conclusion. Now, joining me on the Matt's Movie Reviews podcast is the director and writer of rent power John Stevenson. John, I thank you very much for joining me on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to chat with you. I guess my first question is the most obvious one, um, specific to the time period of the movie. The film is set in 1990 and also deals with specific technology of the time, which is VHS or VHS tapes in this case. Considering we're living right now in a really interactive time, you and I are talking from other sides of the world on Zoom right now. Um, why set it at this time period and deal with this technology? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I mean, the aesthetic of the 90s was a big part of it and just making a movie that looked that way. But also just the, the VHS um, mechanism of the whole thing was really interesting to me, especially because, you know, like a vinyl record, a tape has ribbon, you know, and physical parts. And um, I had just never seen VHS sort of portray- portrayed in that same way that we see so much with the vinyl. So I thought that was a a really good way into it. And also, um, you know, the nature of David's relationships um, are kind of one way. And so we have a lot of interactive things nowadays, but for Renapal to be a VHS tape, it was a one-way conversation. And, you know, David tries as hard as he can to make it not seem that way, but ultimately it is. So, um, yeah, I think... uh, Plus, we just had a lot of really cool props from the 90s that we had access to. So, Once you hit all those, see all these cool props from the 90s, like I was born in 81, so I kind of grew up with all of this kind of stuff. I'm not sure about yourself, John, but once you do see this stuff, does it bring back a lot of a certain sense of nostalgia, a certain sense of memories, looking at all these kind of old tech? Because I don't know about you, but when I come across like old VHS tapes, I have stashed in some box somewhere. I, that, that stuff really comes back to like a lot of feelings, a lot of emotions, a lot of time spent tracking the VHS tapes, just all these, mm-hmm. all these stuff just kind of comes to mind. Yeah. Um, you really had to, to work to enjoy your content in that time. And now it's so easy to, to access all that stuff, but you had to put, you know, and that's uh, also <laughs> related to his like film projector, his film reels that mm. he used in the film. It was a lot of work to set up what he did. And so, you know, um, for me too, the <clears throat> the sounds are really a big part of it for me. I'm a very audio sort of driven person with my memory, um, and um, the way that the tape sounds going into the v- VCR, and the way that the TV buzzes at that certain frequency when nothing else is on, those are the kind of things that I wanted to um, feel from the '90s, not the neon day glow kind of stuff, you know? Yeah, definitely. 
I mentioned in my um, introduction that this film deals with character and not caricature. Um, people can make jokes and insults about men who live in their mum's basement, etc. Um, but with David, there's really there's a sympathy there for him. Um, he's he is a caregiver. He has a mother that has Alzheimer's. He takes care of her. He's isolated because of that. There's hints towards a troubled uh, childhood as well. Um, how important was it? to make sure that David was presented in this way because so many people can go to really exploitative route as considering, considering towards the more humane way in uh, the way that you um, wrote him and had him portrayed um, in the movie. I feel like in one way or another, in one way or another, everybody has sort of felt the way that David feels in this movie. And that's alone and not validated and you know, hating yourself and feeling sorry and mad at people who are, you know, wronged you. And a lot of people spend a lot of time in that place. Um, and so that was kind of, uh, you know, with any movie villain, they have to be someone who's, if they're relatable, they're that much more evil. Mm. You know, if you kind of can under, really understand where they're coming from. And so with David's kind of trajectory down this dark road, um, you know, it's, you, you really have to have the audience love him and want to pull him back from this ledge the entire time. And so it's just really cool. If that's resonating with people that, um, they feel for him because, you know. On the other end of this, uh, two hand, you have Andy, this, uh, it's kind of a bit of a really bit of a complex complex role. He's a he's a confidant. He, he's a friend. He's a guru. And it also kind of approaches this dark side as well, which I don't want to get into because I don't want to spoil it for people. What I really liked about it though was the ambiguity about it. You could easily have gone down so many different roads. A lot of people have gone like some type of I don't know supernatural force or or it's aliens because it's always aliens. Um, how important was you to make sure that ambiguity was in there to make sure there was no resolutions of what this thing is and how it affects um, the character of David? Yeah, it's something um, that I spent a lot of time thinking about in writing the dialogue of Andy and, and sort of the structure of the dialogue scenes between Andy and David is that from the moment David puts the tape in, we don't necessarily know if what he's seeing is real or not, or if it's just a warped version of what's real. And so in that way, um, the audience watches the movie wondering, you know, well, what is it? Is he haunted? Is it, you know, and uh, <clears throat> that was, what was so great about Will Wheaton's performance was that he was able to kind of ride that line of a genuine, honest t- videotape host and some sort of force that's inside the tape. Um, but, you know, there's, David has a lot of, he takes a lot of responsibility for, or he, you know, is responsible for a lot of the things that happen in the movie. Mm. So it's also a lot of his choices. And, uh, you know, um, I forgot your question. You can cut that part out. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, but, um, but it's important though, that that ambiguity was placed in there because you could have gone down different routes, couldn't you? And I'm sure there would have been uh, pressure to make sure that this was kind of seen more of a generic kind of horror movie, as opposed to just really kind of psychological study you have on screen now. Yeah, I think there was a lot of different avenues we could have taken with writing, <laughs> with writing the movie, how it was written, and how it, the the parameters of what we had to do with the production and the the money that we had and the time that we had with each actor was kind of, we, this is the movie that we ended up making, but there's other versions earlier in the script, you know, that where Andy kind of manifests himself in different ways. Mm. Um, And uh, you know, so there, there had, we had more time with Will Wheaton, for example, we could have done a lot more with that, but I'm just really happy with how it turned out. Anyway, it was all meant to kind of be the way it is. When it comes to, Will and um, Brian, is there any type of interaction between the two? Is Will actually, I'm sorry, is Brian actually um, talking to a videotape? Is that how you film it? Or do you have Will off camera? How does that actually work there? Because that was really interesting to me. Yeah. So Will Wheaton came um, in the middle of the shoot. We had shot like two weeks of the film. And then he came for one day to a studio in Colorado and filmed all of his Andy stuff on to, you know, we just recorded it um, on a set. Then we took that footage and edited what we called the Andy tapes. 
and gave those to Brian Landis Falcons, and he kind of took them home for a few weeks over the holiday break and just basically listened to them all the time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> then we had another two weeks of shooting to complete. So we came back from our holiday break and uh, our producer, Jimmy, had a laptop with the footage loaded onto it with an HDMI cable running to the TV set and, you know, was was just kind of using Will Wheaton like a puppet and would hit the space bar to hit play, give BLF a little more time if he needed to, you know, process in a moment or something. And then he would stop it. And so it was a really cool relationship between the producer and Brian because uh, they had to work out the timing and the rehearsals and all that sort of stuff. It, we're living in really interesting times, and especially in regards to the intimate nature we have with our screens. We carry them with them everywhere we go. Um, they're our confidence. We seek medical advice before we go to a doctor. There's, you seek sexual satisfaction from it. There's so many things, even these days in the times of COVID, like uh, as myself, as a, as a practicing Christian, I'm watching my church services through a stream. I can't go to church. I have to watch it through a stream. It's like everything's on there now. Um, Why do you think it is that when it comes to the darker, more seductive side of the web, the things that kind of what, you know, that um, David has gone through in a similar sort of way with Andy, that we let our guard down when it comes to something that's on a screen as opposed to one-on-one interactions? It just seems like that those same type of alarm bells that go off in our heads, if you're talking to a a person one-on-one, you can tell something might be wrong, that when it comes to a screen, we just that stuff just goes away and we are just left sometimes duped by what's happening from the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, ultimately, you know, everybody has a, a window to the world, whether, whether it's your TV or your device or, you know, movie screen and you, it's really, it is remarkable how quickly people are willing to give them a piece of themselves to that, to, to seek validation from social media or, you know, just idolizing celebrities or um, listening to a psycho president, you know, there, it's really easy for people to fall under the spell of a screen because it seems like that's where all the important things come from that we should care about. um, When ultimately we should close the window and turn around and see where we are. And uh, you know, so it's, it's, I think that's part of the horror of it is how easy and relatable it is for someone to, you know, be that vulnerable. Speaking of relatable, a lot of people are going to be watching the film while they're on lockdown. There's going to be a lot of people out there that are isolated and such. I, I imagine though, at the end of the day, what we want to say to people out there who might even feel an inkling of whatever David's feeling in this movie is that talk to someone, get out of that space um, it's important that uh, you create real relationships and just stay away from that screen, man. But not in this case. Watch this movie, but <laughs> in, in <the> other cases. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's what's great about horror movies is that they help us express how we're feeling. And a lot of people think, you know, misunderstand horror to be something that is, you know, sadomasochist or something. But really, ultimately, it's just that everyone has fears and they need to express them. And sometimes when you watch a movie, you go, oh, I didn't know that I felt that way about this thing, but I, mm. I do. So, um, in that way, art is super powerful. Um, but yeah, you have to just still have your priorities and knowing where that boundary is. So for everyone out there, September 11, select feeders, digital and cable video on demand. Make sure you watch rent a power. I really highly recommend this film. I come across a lot of horror movies and it's really rare to find that humanity in the horror sometimes. So John Stevenson, congratulations to you and thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you.